Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. What's up, man? I'm chilling. Um, yeah, chilling, drinking a fucking Miller, kid. Haven't made it through your Millers yet. <laughs> Still got a few to go. It's Miller Park <laughs> over there. That'll happen when you when you order it by the gallon. Uh, dude, I feel like we should do some sort of like quarantine hair growing thing because your hair is like maybe the longest I've ever seen it in all the time oh, that we've getting, known each other. It's getting pushed down by my headphones too. Check this. Oh shit yeah, out. that shit is for sure the longest I've ever seen it. Yeah, dog. I tried to I tried to style it today for the first time in like a month because I was like, oh, that's a thing I used to do. Maybe I should try that out. Yeah, and it's just outrageous, <laughs> and it was totally. Totally worthless to attempt to make any sense of what's going on up there right now. Maybe we need to do another Instagram live uh, one of these days, but it's just a hair check in where we just say, hey, how long your hair, bro? I was due for a cut because I was out of town for a while and I was due for a cut the day that Minnesota closed everything. Yep, yep, yep. So like I in the morning, I was like, this feels like something I probably shouldn't do. And I, I canceled it. And then by noon, the governor was like, "Yeah, you legally can't do this." And, you're and like, that was now two months. And that was two months ago. Yeah, buddy. So I, w- I was due two months ago, and now here we are. I think I'm growing the flow back out, man. I kind of decided. I was like, "Well, yeah, I've I've gotten past the most annoying like intermediate stage, so now I think I might as well just keep going." I said the same thing to wifey. I was like, "Part like normally the thing that gets me to get a haircut." is when it's like sticking straight out the side of my head and like just like purely my shit's been over my ears for a month yeah so once it gets I'm, just, I'm used to it now right exactly once it gets over your ears it's like all right now i'm okay it's all the same yeah um yeah it's going down to my my butt now beard my beard's huge as hell too man i'm gonna do the same thing with the beard man i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm gonna turn into fucking uh tom hanks in forrest gump you go you go full dumbledore full dumbledore on them <laughs> let's go man i wish i wish my shit was just white oh god it'd be so fire if my hair was just like silver that's the other fun thing about me growing my shit out on the, on the sides it's like half gray which is which is really fun god, that's so sick dude yeah, I wish I got a ways to go before I'm Dumbledore status, but bro, maybe, by the time it's that long, it probably will be that white. Maybe this is the time where you see what your facial hair do for the. Oh, it does nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, let's see what that facial hair do if you just really let it ride. It it looks hideous. That's what it do. Could you just do straight up mustache? Oh yeah, I, think, I can grow a real solid mustache. See, that's what I'm saying, dude. I think you actually could pull off like just straight stash. It's just like it's here. Like sideburns don't connect to chin region. Sure, 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 sure. Everything sure. else is pretty solid. Would wifey would wifey be like disappointed if you went straight stash mode, or would she care? I mean, not any more than usual, probably. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so no real consequences there. I think it would be fine, bro. I think you should do it. I think you should do a what if quarantine well, stash. I just tri- I just shaved today, and I could have I could have done it had we had this conversation about five hours ago. Well, the bad news is I think you have plenty of time still. <laughs> ne- next week I will check in with a mustache for you. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I even love if it's it. just for the hour that we record, and then it has to go. I will mm. I will show you what that looked like. I don't think. I don't think a week is going to be, I think can, you got to commit to like 30 days, like four episodes. Jesus. <laughs> and you can, and you can shave everything else, but you have to keep the stash on the whole time for 30 days. And we'll do it. I don't, and we'll, I definitely don't have to do that. <laughs> no, I'm saying if we make this agreement, that, oh, that's like, well, the, then, I'm, then I'm out. Damn. In that case, we do not have an agreement. All right. Well, at least try it for a week, and maybe it looks tight as hell, and you'll be like, this is my calling. How did I not do this for so long? I wasn't planning to shave between now and next Tuesday anyway, so All right. we should be good. All right. I like it. Let's do it. Uh, what else is new other than not being able to go outside and take care of our physical appearances? <laughs> <laughs> we can go outside. We just can't, you know. Well, I mean, go outside with the purpose stuff. of taking care of our physical appearances. Oh, right, right, right. Um, I've been running and lifting weights every day, which feels good. Like I'm being somewhat productive. Yeah, buddy. Um, Minnesota finally doesn't suck outdoors. So that's been nice. Preach, preach, preach. Just had a little 
little fire in my backyard yesterday. That felt pretty nice. good. Uh, I started watching the great Australian baking show the other night. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dude, it's so fucking rowdy compared to the other ones. Uh, well, the f- that sounds that sounds no, pretty on brand very- for Australia, doesn't it? It lived up to my uh, stereotyped expectations. Fantastic! All, all of so you've watched the the British one. That's no. That's like, not a cake. That's a cake. <laughs> you could have done the actual knife thing, like they used. <laughs> you right. You know what? On on second thought, that would have worked. Bark Bjork. Bark. Um, we have buttons. That's fun. Give me the buttons. I'm just gonna give me the buttons. I'm gonna push random ones. Remind me to push random ones. Um push it in the first Oh dude, you know what we should do? Do you remember uh did you ever watch the rush hour movies? Yeah, I don't know about movies. I've seen at least the first one probably 15 years ago or more. I used to love those movies one and two. I used to love those movies when I was a kid. And there's a point where uh where like the little girl is yelling at him, push your damn button, because he's got like a detonator for mm. like a vest, and I'm I feel like having that little girl scream, push your damn button, would be a pretty <laughs> fun button to have you be able to push. You should find that and send it to me, and I will I will integrate it. Deal done. Doing it. Boop here. Boop here. Uh oh, but uh, the Australian baking show. So have you watched any of the the British one? I've later I. The like I only understand this show in concept. <laughs> okay, well, in on the British one and like the Canadian one and the other iterations of it, they use the same music for all of it. For for each iteration of the show, they use like the same music cues and stuff and themes. But do they like? But do they give it a cultural spin, or is it the, it's no, the it's exact like same? The, exa- it, the, okay. the exact same music, and all it's right. very like. NPR uh, strings and like percussion and piano underscore type shit. Okay, got it. And in the first like minute, the intro of the Australian one, they've run through like seven different EDM club remixes of pop songs (laughs) in this montage of (laughs) cakes and shit. It's just super over the top. Oh my God. Like like Taylor Swift, uh, like hard style remixes and shit. Wow. There's a dude on the first season who on the first episode shows up in a sleeveless t-shirt. God bless. <laughs> Absolutely God bless. Uh, they have to censor out a lot more stuff. People are like throwing cakes in the trash and calling calling them all kinds of names. Dude, Australians, they just have a different, they have a different, uh, <laughs> they have a different cultural understanding of like what, acceptable words are like there's one word that like we can't say and we would never say that they just say to everybody all the time yeah i'm pretty sure this woman called her cake that word like 12 times i mean and then and then whacked it in the bin whacked it in the bin look at you that's, picking up the that's lingo a, well that's that's not an Aussieism. that's a that's a britism but i know i meant the lingo from all of your cultural vacations oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. into this show itself <laughs> <laughs> so far, the the Canadian one and the Australian one do not uh, hold up to the the British one, but they're both very enjoyable. I don't know. The Australian one sounds like it holds up <laughs> in its own special way. It sounds like it's it holds very up. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan, last week we yelled at each other about UFOs and forgot to complete our "Is It Joy" segment. That's true. So I want to make sure that we get to it this time. Okay, deal. Do you want to go first, or should I? Uh, you know, to be honest. I thought, oh, by the way, guys, we love each other. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Spencer and I have been homies for 15 years. We love each other. Don't worry. Uh, also- we've, had, we've had worse arguments over dumber things, if you can believe it. <laughs> I actually thought that, too, when I saw everybody concerned in the Facebook group. I was like, oh, that's, hey, that's not the biggest fight we've ever had. And it's also not the dumbest thing we've ever fought about either. I mean, it, it's not not dumb, but we've done dumber. Preach. Uh, also, this is not a, a, a tease intentionally, but we did kind of carry on that conversation a little bit on the Patreon uh, this week. So I don't know. We it, attempted a slightly more civil version of it. Yeah. Then. Yeah. So if you want to go to patreon.com slash what if podcast and hear the, the conclusion of that uh, kind of conversation uh, that that's over there. Um, 
Yeah, I actually, when you said do our joy thing, I was like, wait, you're telling me things that are bringing you joy, like Aussie people calling their cakes bad words. But I realized that was, we were just saying, what have you been up to? Less what's bringing you joy. I mean, it, so, it was both, but yeah. All right. Well, talk to me, Goose. What's, uh, what is bringing you joy? Um, novelty Twitter accounts. Oh yeah, talk to him. <laughs> Tell the people you're gonna, this, you're, this, you're gonna get a thousand followers just by mentioning it. <laughs> this, this is gonna make sense for probably like less than one percent of the people that listen to this show. But yeah, the crossover um, game might not be too thorough here. No, I wouldn't think so. But I made a Twitter account uh, called Griselda Adlibs, where I just try and transcribe different members of Griselda Records adlibs and type them into Twitter. And hit sent. They are a New York based rap group that with some out, outrageous ad libs. They holler things like doot 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 and <laughs> bo, 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 boom and like crazy shit like that uh, in their music. And it's really I'm funny. Just gonna send it. So if you want to go follow G, G ad libs on Twitter, you can see some dumb shit. It's fantastic. We're going to make it. We're going to make it into a huge thing. <laughs> Everyone's gonna, everyone's gonna follow it. It's gonna, it's gonna be so huge. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be crazy. Um, what do you got? I hey, speaking of the the global baking show phenomenon, uh, yeah, yeah. I like many folks in the quarantine times have decided to learn how to bake bread. <laughs> why okay somebody needs to explain this to me yes why why did that become or how did that become the go-to activity for so many folks that's a great question well mine's a little different than most people's i've always wanted to bake bread actually so when my dad was a kid growing up in south minneapolis my grandma was like the neighborhood baker like she would like bake the bread for the neighborhood and like whatever, sell barter bread to like families in the neighborhood. Did your dad grow up in like the 1820s? What the fuck? <laughs> no, but like, you know, how old is your dad? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's that weird. Like people are getting <laughs> fresh baked bread from their neighbors. Was he born before supermarkets? He, no, I, it's, it wasn't impossible to get bread elsewhere, <laughs> but it was like a way to Did get your grandma invent bread. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> my grandma. Well, no, in fact, bread only goes back two generations. My, my grandma was roughly uh, seven to 10,000 years old <laughs> uh, when she had my dad. And, <laughs> and she was really so good at baking bread neighbors. by that point. Uh, she had baked a lot of loaves of bread in those 10,000 years. Um, no, but because so of that, you're saying you're genetically predisposed to bread baking? Yeah. And like, I remember her baking like when we were growing up and stuff and I always had a affinity for it and was like, it'd be cool to be good at that. But the thing about baking bread is it's kind of tedious. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of cycles, like making your own sourdough starter. It takes a lot of like focus and like, you got to feed it every that's why day I don't and stir it. That's why I don't understand why everyone like jumped into this activity. Like, yeah, uh, it's a ton of work and it's probably not going to, you're not going to be good at it right away. And the payoff is a fucking loaf of bread. <laughs> Yo, but check this out though. I made a really, really dank loaf of bread. <laughs> is, is that a, is that a good adjective in this yeah, uh, scenario? It was, okay. I made a delicious loaf of sourdough and I'm super proud of it. I just, I don't understand why we're like, okay, you got to stay in your house for the next few weeks. And then suddenly everyone's like, Okay, bet. So bread and push ups. But I feel like got it. Bre bread and push ups. Cool. But I feel like it's the same reason everybody's like, I'm going to do like a puzzle or like read. Like it's activities that are sort of like they they'll just barely keep you from killing yourself. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like low efforts, but also like high in, uh, I don't know, high investment things. Yeah, high investment, up. low reward is all the things you're describing. I mean, hey, you want to spend you want to spend six hours, or maybe like several days, or maybe weeks to have a picture of something on your dining room table. <laughs> and do, does and that do, sound like fun? And do you want to be frustrated 
about 85% of the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and at the beginning, you get to pay money for this experience. Yes. It's really great. And then you get to pay money to waste your time, be frustrated, and then have a picture of like some cats on your table that then you instantly get to destroy. I was going to say, and then you immediately just take two arms and swipe it in back into its box and never touch it again. Yep. Yep. Puzzles. Hashtag puzzles. Uh, this was supposed to be about joy. I apologize. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing that made me joy was like I made my own bread. I felt self sufficient. It was very delicious. There you go. I put some rosemary butter on it and ate it with scrambled mm. eggs this morning, and it was pretty mm. fucking bomb. Sick. So that brought me joy. It brought me joy. I felt like I was connected to my grandma who's no longer with us. It felt like I had learned a new skill. It felt like I could be like, well, if it all goes to shit, I could go find a field and make myself some bread or something. You've been making your own flour, too? You growing wheat in the backyard? You just got to hit it with a rock a lot. I think that's basically how it works. That's not how it grows, bro. What do you, you mean? You got to grow it first. Oh, no. I would, you don't I would, create would... wheat by hitting the dirt with a rock. Oh. You got to you gotta plant some wheat. What? Are you sure? You got to tend your crops, you, my guy. You sure? You ever, you ever grown wheat, bro? <laughs> no, but I've hit the ground with a rock before and no wheat popped up. Maybe you didn't hit it hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> ah <laughs> oh, fuck um i was gonna suggest we play some voicemails but i look at our time and we've been dicking around for 16 minutes we sure so have. maybe we do maybe we do another uh voicemail thing one of these days we've got like a fucking 50 11 of them again in in our in our inbox yeah we uh if you're new to the show or don't know we did a voicemails only bonus episode uh, a few weeks back and yeah, we have a we have a we have a hotline or a cold line, and it's six one two two four six four six one four. You can leave us a voicemail, and we try to listen to all of them. And uh, we'll do another. Yeah, we'll do another one of those. That that'd be fun to play through some of. Them. Okay. Also, one more thing before we get into talking about aliens from Maine. I heard a Longfellow boom the other night. Oh shit! That's right. We texted about this. I think it was, was that Sunday night? Uh, Yeah, that this was Sunday? Sunday night. At exactly 9.18, I was sitting in my living room, plugging in my computer to the TV so we could watch some Australian Bake Off. Let's go. And I heard what sounded like a an explosion outside. Can you describe it for the people? It sounded like a... Um, you know, the fireworks that just kind of squeal as they go up and then it's one big explosion, one, just like one big boom, concussive thump. Yeah. And it's like, it's just like one bright flash of light and that's it. Yes. Yep. It sounded like one of those without any of the lead up. It was just suddenly the, the concussive boom. It also, in my, in my, I didn't hear this one, which is funny cause we live close enough that I would have thought we would have both heard it, but I could have just been doing something else. Um, I remember it feeling like like when you hear the concussive boom fireworks, you get a sense of the distance that they are away. Like you can tell when you hear them when you're like watching a fireworks display, like the way that the sound hits you that you can tell it's like kind of high and far away. I remember it feeling more like it was like ground level, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I guess I didn't I didn't really get a sense of distance other than like. It was just loud. Did you go outside um, to investigate? I did not. Um, I did make sure to check what time it was, uh, which was 9.18, which I thought was interesting because then our our homie who spends way too much time on Nextdoor, Matt. <laughs> what up, Matt? Um, sent us a screenshot the next day. Uh, of next door that said Longfellow Boom just heard nine eighteen p.m. So you knew it was the same sound. Yeah, and then someone in that same thread said that they live uh, four blocks away from me, and it sounded close. Mm. So this thing could be heard for you know for at least a like four ish block radius, if not more. And we both thought it was loud, so it could probably be heard for. More than that. It's probably just the fucking maniac who was blowing up mortars in his alley last summer up to his same bullshit. He's blown up mortars in his alley this summer now. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, but, this is a reference to episode 171. It's a phenomena in South Minneapolis of people hearing massive concussive booms and not being able to figure out where the fuck they came from. Yeah, that boy big. That boy, that boy loud. Forgot that I had a thing. Push your damn button. <laughs> Hell yeah, bro. Um, we have uh, speaking of. UFOs from Maine. We have a we have a special shout out slash thank you for bringing us the topic of today's episode. Yeah, the the homie Michelle sent us a really sweet care package full of shirts and books and patches and stickers and all kinds of cool stuff. And one of those things was a book called UFOs Over Maine: Close Encounters from the Pine Tree State, written by Nomar Slavik. A big thank you to you, uh, Michelle, for everything. Uh, Such an insanely sweet uh, gift and such a fun thing to open up out of the P.O. box. Um, And we want to shout out, uh, along with shouting out Michelle, uh, a lot of the cool stuff uh, that that we got came from. uh, It looks like the Green Hand Bookshop and Coast City Comics, uh, both in Portland, Maine. So shout out to those spots. And the dope, dope <laughs> shit uh, that. Yeah, <laughs> motherfucker. And the dope shit uh, that uh, that arrived in that box. So thanks, Michelle, for showing us what you got. We appreciate it. So I was I was looking through this book the other night, and as I was reading through it, there's a section, or like three different sections that all revolve around the same story, but like different angles of it. Tight. And I realized that part of one of these angles we have covered on the show before when we did our Men in Black episode oh. many, many moons ago. Oh, dip. <laughs> Do you remember the story about the man in black uh, who showed up at somebody's house with no hair and wearing lipstick and then told the guy that he was going to make his heart disappear? Yeah. And then the guy got freaked out and then he like left. He left because like his battery was running low. Yeah, I do. He was wearing a hat, wasn't he? Didn't he have like a hat on? Yeah, 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 yeah. But he could. So that yeah, I remember that. Well, we'll revisit that story. But it, it turns out that that story that we told is actually part of a bigger, like, three part story. Oh, with the same that person I was, or the same area? Wait. <clears throat> did that it's story... the same area and related to the same uh incident so to clarify that incident that we talked about on the men in black episode happened in maine yes Got it. and there was a, a larger context to that story that we were not aware of when we did that episode oh no is it just like a really spooky guy being real spooky in his spooky neighborhood uh i mean it might be that but that's not all that it is okay tight <laughs> <laughs> well we'll just go through it let's go so it starts at loring air force base in october of 1975 okay okay and loring air force base is in limestone maine and it's there partially because it was the closest point in the continental u.s to europe okay got it makes sense so it, it's basically as far as east as you can go and still be in the united states makes sense or whatever the this it's the it's the point where the distance between the u.s and europe is the smallest i got you i got you which was important during the cold war so in estimating this distance i'm just kidding go ahead (laughs) oh i I got a few for you later don't worry let's go (laughs) bro whoever put in the facebook group the fucking Craigslist post of somebody trying to sell a dresser and estimating the size by holding their <laughs> cat up to it. I fucking hate y'all. <laughs> Damn, that's your science. So on October 27th of 1975 at 745 PM, Staff Sergeant Danny Lewis saw a red light hovering about 300 feet off the ground and moving towards the Air Force Base. Okay. And as it gets closer, he realizes that it's not just a ball of light. It's actually part of a craft, or it is a craft with a light on the front. And he contacts his, uh, like, control tower guy to see if he has anything on radar. And 
something shows up on radar about 10 miles away from the base. Are we sure this isn't Santa Claus? On October 27th? Craft with a red light on the front. I'm just saying. <laughs> he's he's Ru- awfully early. Ru- Rudy, maybe they're getting some practice runs <laughs> in, and Rudy's just, you know. I mean. It's raining motherfuckers. <laughs> God, I love that application to Santa Claus. <laughs> Coming down the chimney. It's, God damn, it's raining motherfuckers. It's raining motherfuckers. It could apply to the reindeer as well. Yeah, I uh, suppose. So anyway, they, they have this thing on radar about 10 miles away. And they try to radio it and don't get any response from it. And the next time that this thing registers on the radar, like the next blip seconds later, it's over the base. Oh, so that's acor- exciting. Acor- according to their radar, it's moved 10 miles in a matter of seconds. And it's hanging out near their nuclear storage facility because this Air Force base uh, existed partially so that we could launch nukes at the Russians as quickly as possible if we needed to. Fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Fantastic. Uh, the base was at that point put on alert and they sent some people out to go try and locate this thing visually. And it was seen again, hovering about 150 feet above the base, uh, specifically above where nukes were stored. And it was at that point also confirmed again by radar, which I don't, I don't know how radar works. But I didn't think it worked at like uh, that low to the ground. Five hundred feet. Radar's picking. Radar's picking something up that's a hundred and fifty feet off the ground somehow. Oh, the initial estimate was five hundred feet, and the later one was one fifty. Uh, three hundred, and then down to one fifty. Oh. <clears throat> um. I'm gonna. I'm sure there are different types of radar systems and and whatnot. Yeah, but. and I'm gonna say something real dumb. Uh, but that's not uncommon um <laughs> I, I would imagine like a uh, air force base or a naval base would have some sort of radar that would be able to track moving objects anywhere around it at all kinds of heights because you would need that right like i mean yeah i guess i was that's kind of what i was saying like I'm, I'm sure they have some sort of <clears throat> some different type of radar system that is uh Whatever, I'm going to stop <laughs> trying to explain radar. Let's explain a so, thing that we already acknowledge we, we do not clearly do not understand. Clearly do not understand. Um, so anyway, they send somebody out there to try and see it visually. What the fuck are you doing here, little buddy? <laughs> and it's it circles the base once and then takes off. So they they send a bunch of troops out to conduct like a full search of the grounds to make sure that there wasn't anyone or anything else on site that shouldn't be. Okay. They didn't find anything, but they reported the incident to a bunch of different uh, organizations, including Strategic Air Command, the National Military Command Center, the Air Force Forward Operations Division, and the Air Force Chief of Staff. Okay. So they... Took it seriously, I guess. Sounds, uh, sure sounds like. <laughs> sounds about yeah. as serious as you can take it. And then the next night, on October 28th, again at exactly 745, they saw the same thing again. And this time they first saw it on radar, about three miles from the base, and then five people saw it visually, again, hovering over the nuclear storage area on the base. Except this time, there was also a second craft with it. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Wait, when you say five people saw it, they saw it visually, like firsthand, or they yes. saw it like... Yes. So it was not radar. They had a ra- radar confirmation and then sent people out to try and visually confirm it, and five people visually saw two crafts hovering around the base. This is tight. I like this. This is good. <laughs> this is very good. Very strong. Um, the craft was described by Sergeant Steven Eichner as, quote, a silent orange and red object shaped like an elongated football hovering above the runway. It was about four car lengths long, solid with no doors or windows, and no visible propellers or engines. 
Ryan, would you care to uh, describe roughly how long four car lengths is? Okay. So we talking like 70s Cadillac DeVille here, or are we talking like... That's, that's up to you, bud. Toyota Yaris or whatever. Is it a Yaris? Wow. Is that a real wow. thing? That's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. A, a Chevy Aveo, perhaps? I'm just going to say I did a really fucking good job of doing a big car and a small car right off the top of my head. <laughs> you nailed it. You nailed it. I was going to go Chevy Aveo and a Ford Windstar, but your your examples work just as well. Uh, you know, I mean, what do you got? You got a you got a Hyundai Sonata, what, 14, maybe 18 <laughs> feet long. So let's say that's more like average in between the two. So four, okay. four, if it's four car lengths long, you know, we're talking like, uh, you know, roughly 50 to 60 feet. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for the participation. Happy to help. Happy to <laughs> help. Extremely helpful. So they, they send some more uh, people out to try and get a look at this thing in a truck. To clarify, to try and chase it down. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is this thing just hovering or is it like going around the base? Uh, both, it sounds like at different times. Okay. So it approached from, I mean, the first night they picked it up at a distance initially of 10 miles. Uh, the second night they picked it up initially when it was three miles away, it was then hovering near the storage facility, but then also just like making laps around the whole base. It sounds like what, uh, what year is this again? I forgot. 75. Okay. Yeah. Got it. 1975. Got it. Uh, they go hop in a truck and try and chase this thing down. And at one point, get within 300 feet of it. And Sergeant Stephen Eichner again uh, said, quote, there were these waves in front of the object and all the colors were blending together. The object was solid and we couldn't hear any noise coming from it. Whoa. So I don't know what he means by waves in front of it. I'm imagining like... Um, like how heat can sort of distort, cause like a visual distortion, maybe. That's what I was kind of envisioning too, like a like a rolling road in the desert that has that kind of uh, mirage effect to it. Yeah. Um, moments after they got within three hundred feet of it, it just disappeared. And You're too for the close, next man. Several. <laughs> You're too close, man. <laughs> We out of here! The next several nights, this thing came back. Sick. And at one point, or at several points, the base requested helicopter backup from the National Guard. Um, and there's a quote from another, not Eichner, but another sergeant on the base who said, Time after time, though, when a sighting was reported, the helicopter crew spotted nothing. At one point, ground personnel watched as the helicopter and crew were within 100 feet of this object, yet radar nor the helicopter crew were able to see anything. Mm. So there are people on the ground looking at a National Guard helicopter 100 feet away from a UFO that the guys in the helicopter and the people running the radar are saying they can't see. Wait, I'm confused. Okay. So they're saying they're looking at it, but it's not showing up on radar. So they're saying the people on the ground yes. could see the UFO. But the people who but are the people, way closer in the chopper the people, couldn't see it. The people in the helicopter right next to it were saying they could not see anything. See, this is this is another potentially tight example of stupid aliens where they're like We'll just we'll just turn our we'll just turn our cloaking device on and anything near us won't see us. But like everybody far away is like you're right there because it only works for like a couple hundred feet, bro. We see you. But that was enough in this case, right? I mean, enough to confuse the shit out of some people at an Air Force Base in Maine. <laughs> That's for sure. Um. Okay, so that's part one of this story. They never figured out what it was. Uh, you said it came back it. five nights in a row. Well, so it said in the in the book it says the twenty seventh and twenty eighth, and then it says this repeated for several nights. So, whatever several means to you, I guess. Sure. Um, and they were never able to figure out what it was. 
and eventually just had to move on with life. And you gave up. You gave up on him. That same night as the first sighting, the 27th of October, a dude named David Stevens and his roommate Glenn had a weird encounter with a UFO as well. Okay. They, they lived in Norway, Maine, which is about 300 miles south of the Air Force Base. Okay. And their encounter started when they heard a loud bang or explosion outside and went to investigate. Uh oh. So if you hear a Longfellow boom, don't go looking because the aliens might get you. Maybe it's just uh maybe it's just aliens apparating like in Harry Potter. <laughs> there yeah, there's like a crack when they apparate, right? Boom. <laughs> they just Face your fears, son. showed up. So they go out to look uh or try and see what this loud bang was sure and they didn't see anything but for some reason decided to drive to thompson lake in oxford maine which i don't know exactly where they're starting but norway maine and thompson lake are let's see it's probably about a and it looks like it, depending on where in Norway they are, because it's sort of like a large, I think, unincorporated area. It's maybe like a five to ten mile drive. So probably like a 10, 10 minute-ish, 10, 15 minute drive on country highways. To clarify, you said they didn't see anything, but they just chose to go there? Is it like an overlook Correct. or something? I don't know. It says, um, let me find the specific wording in the book. I think it said like... They felt compelled. Uh, let's see. The two men ran to see what had disturbed. Uh, on a whim, it is told, David and Glenn got into their vehicle and decided to drive towards Lake Thompson. Hmm. Don't know. Weird. If it was just like, this is what we got to do, or Call. we think we that's the direction we thought it came from, so maybe we should go that way. or Calling our name. Or completely unrelated, like, let's just go to the lake. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So any, so anyway, they hop in their car, and as they're driving, their car is surrounded by some sort of force field that takes control of the car. So they're they're both in the car, but they're no longer in control of it. Push your damn button. <laughs> and their car starts going over 100 miles an hour without them doing anything. That sounds like a bummer. <laughs> I'm getting dickered on this one. Yeah, without without a choice. <laughs> and their self-driving car uh, flying at 100 miles an hour down country highways eventually just stops in the middle of a field where they see a pair of bright lights on the other side of this field. Ooh. Fuck no, fuck no, <laughs> fuck no. The lights then begin hovering and they realize that it's not just a light, that it's part of uh what they call a long multicolored craft okay all right now we're talking <laughs> <laughs> let's go so at that point apparently they can control their car again and they decide to get the fuck out of there away from the ufo that tractor beamed their car into the middle of the field sounds like a little too little too late at this point but all right <laughs> game on Whoa! And as they're driving, I'm assuming back home, a different light, I don't know how exactly they knew that, I guess a different color or something, approached their car from behind, surrounded their car, and then the next thing they remember is that they're parked next to Trip Pond, which is about, at the closest point, about a mile away from Thompson Lake. A little bit of missing uh, missing travel time. Yeah, they don't remember how they got there. Um and then they see that first UFO again, plus two more UFOs that were hovering over the pond, releasing some sort of vapor. God damn. <laughs> There's a fucking party. God damn. So one UFO pulls them into, pulls them towards the pond. There are two more that are gassing the pond and this gas is uh, like billowing towards their car. You guys, quit gassing the pond. <laughs> Uh, the next thing they know, it's daylight, and they're still parked next to this pond, and they drive home. All right. 
Hell of a night. <laughs> Hell of a night, uh-huh. guys. Um, quoting from uh, Nomar's book again, it says, quote, their eyes and necks burned. And David claimed to have several loose teeth because of the encounter. Whoa, not that's not cool. That's extremely uncool. <laughs> that is easily my least favorite symptom thus far of people <laughs> interacting with a UFO. Without a doubt. Hell no. I've heard of literally all, like R- paralysis and fucking nosebleeds and fucking headaches. <laughs> loose teeth is my least favorite thing we've encountered. <laughs> Hell no. That was fucked. That was a bit fucked. That was a bit fucked, bud. You know what probably that- happened? <laughs> you guys were too drunk and you keep driving around the lakes running into shit. And when you keep banging your face miles, on the- at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, when you keep banging your head on the steering wheel for enough time, you're going to wake up with some loose teeth, bud. So that morning, uh, after they got home, a man in black shows up at their door. Quote, dressed in black formal wear with complete with sunglasses and a military haircut. Oh, this guy had hair. So I'm assuming they mean like a black suit, but I'm imagining like a tuxedo just for fun. For- formal wear does sound like you've got the whole <laughs> like, like long tail split tail thing going on. Um, and this this very fancy man asked David if he had seen a UFO the night before. Well, that depends. Can you go fuck yourself? <laughs> and, <laughs> and David said yes, and the man told him to keep his mouth shut about it. Okay. David, being a snitch, went to the, the cops <laughs> right away as soon as the guy left <laughs> and reported his UFO encounter. Amazing. The Norway police didn't know what the fuck to do with a UFO report, and so they forwarded it to uh, a researcher named Shirley Fickett. Okay whose first order of business was to book him some hypnotic regression sessions. Oh, Jesus. Here we go. (laughs) Oh, dang. With a doctor named Herbert Hopkins. And David did eight sessions with Dr. Hopkins, in which he described being abducted and taken aboard a spaceship by Greys who examined him and took skin, hair, and blood samples, as well as a button from his jacket. Uh, I was hoping you were going to say, a button from his belly. (laughs) Took the man's belly button. I just imagine the aliens looking at his jacket and seeing the buttons and being like, you think this thing's alive? Fascinating. Truly (laughs) fascinating. Let's take one just to make sure. It might be some sort of, of, some sort of, being. It's the whole muggle technology thing, man. They're just like, <laughs> wow. Unreal. What, what book are you on, by the way? Look how, how they, far have you gotten? Look how they keep their shirts from showing <laughs> showing off their bellies. I mean, gray you never see Grays wearing shirts. So I, I could imagine them being fascinated with uh with closures. It's yeah. It's true. I mean, they're wearing like fucking like stretchy spacesuit material shit. I think I think they're just naked most of the time, right? Or Nike boys. Maybe they're maybe they're big <laughs> Nike boys. I mean, they're little, but I think they are. Maybe they're little Nike boys. Um, there you go. I am on uh, book four, Goblet of Fire. Oh, the best one. It's really good, man. It's we, it's real good. A whole Harry Potter book with no mention of Quidditch. It's it's beautiful. Oh, it's mentioned for sure. They're just well, not without a single game of Quidditch. Uh one gigantic game of Quidditch because it opens with the Quidditch World Cup. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Without any meaningless, pointless mention of Quidditch. Touche. That is there purely to appeal to children who J.K. Rowling thought would like sports, <laughs> or like this sport she invented. That's <laughs> extremely hard to follow and stupid. Anyway, and she spends like hundreds of pages on in books that are already hundreds of pages too long sometimes. Anyway, they take his button and his hair and his skin and they drop him back off in the field and apparently told him that the encounter would be, quote, buried deep in his subconscious. Oh. Yep. So (laughs) here's what we're going to do. We're going to wipe it from your memory, except... We're going to tell you that we sort of didn't all the way wipe it from your memory. 
We want you to not remember this, but we're going to tell you that there's for sure a way to remember this if you want to. Is that what we're doing? So, yeah, dude sees a UFO, uh, maybe gets abducted, talks to a, a hypnotist about it eight times. And a couple weeks later, an, a Norway police officer named Lloyd Herrick uh, seemed to corroborate David's story. I saw him. They took his belly button. I watched him. Well, not not that part of it. They drilled, um, they drilled his belly button right out of him. <laughs> that's not even a thing that's in this story. I had a telescope. <laughs> I was up on the hill. I saw him by the lake. They took it. <laughs> oh. Uh police officer guy says, quote, I'm just going to read his whole quote. I was patrolling about 1 a.m. This is on October 27th and drove out to Norway Lake west of town where I looked up and saw this thing coming over the pines. I've never seen anything like it before. And I stopped to get out of my cruiser and watch it. It was shaped like a short cigar and had two red lights on it. One in front, one in back. The middle part was black and it couldn't have been more than 800 feet above me. It wasn't going fast. In fact, it was going pretty slowly. I must have watched it for at least a minute as it passed over the lake and headed right in the direction of Norway, the the town, not the country. It must have passed right over the town, and I called the sheriff's office on my radio to say, I don't want to sound corny, but have you heard any reports of UFOs? The dispatcher said something about what had I been drinking, uh, but I was so amazed by this thing. It made no sound. It wasn't a plane. And I said to myself, well, son of a gun, I've seen something I've never seen before. Sick. <laughs> what a line. <laughs> what a line. Which is which is funny to me that when a dude calls the next morning to say, hey, I saw a UFO, that the police would be like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Go talk to Shirley. When one, If one of their police officers had called in a UFO like six hours prior. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I don't know. I mean, I I guess, like, that presumes that, that, like, that that was all connected at the time, you know? Right. I I don't have any idea what Norway main police work was like in the 70s either, but... Or if it was just, like, the late-night dispatch person picked up the phone and was like, Ah oh, shit, George has been drinking again. And then the next morning, a completely different person on dis- dispatch or whatever is just like sure, unaware that that was a thing that happened the night before. I don't know. Yeah. So we have the at least three, well, many people at the Air Force Base, David and his roommate Glenn and Lloyd, the police officer, all seeing a UFO the same night around within a couple hours of each other i'd say that's plenty uh plenty of folks verifying one story and now we have the men in black tie in because the person who was visited by those men in black was dr herbert hopkins who had been doing uh david stevens's hypnotic regressions oh dear and this happened on September 11th of 1976, so almost a year after the initial sightings. Okay. Hopkins, Hopkins is home by himself one night, and the phone rings, and the person on the other end says he's a member of the New Jersey UFO Research Foundation and asked if he could discuss the, quote, Stevens case. Hopkins agreed and invited the guy over to his house to talk about it. Okay. He hangs up the phone and walks over to his front door to turn the porch light on. And when he does, the guy is standing on his porch waiting for him. Okay. This is the story we told, right? Yeah. Because I I remember also hating that specific detail a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And and he appears to have no like car or any mode of transportation with him. He just. Oop, here. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. He's just suddenly on his front porch. That's crazy. Um, Hopkins said, quote, I saw no car, and even if he did have a car, he could not have possibly gotten to my house that quickly from any phone. Because this is also 1975 when cell phones didn't exist. Totally. Pre-cell phones, for sure. So, best case scenario, he's calling from a nearby payphone, but, like, as soon as he hangs up the phone, the dude is on his front step. Right. So, 
for some reason, he lets this guy into his house. And he notices that he's wearing a black suit, black hat, and a tie, which all appeared brand new. And he had no hair anywhere on his body, including, like, eyebrows and stuff. And he was wearing bright red lipstick. Fabulous. So they sit down in his living room, and this guy starts asking Hopkins questions about the David Stevens case and UFOs and abductions in general. And then he tells Hopkins that it's very important for him to forget everything he knows about the Stevens case and destroy any notes or recordings that he has. I'm assuming he means like of the uh, hypnotic regressions. Yeah. He also specifically told him to destroy a letter that he had reserved from Shirley Fickett, who was the UFO researcher that connected the two of them initially, um, which he should have had no way of knowing about because right. it was a letter sent between two people who don't know this guy. Right. This fucking weirdo then tells Dr. Hopkins that he, meaning Hopkins, has two coins in his pocket. And that he should take one of them out. Hopkins did have coins in his pocket and take one of them out. And he tells him to hold it in his palm. And as he does, the coin starts changing colors, then becomes translucent, and then disappears out of the palm of his hand. And the man in black tells Hopkins that if he continued his research into UFOs and abductions, he would do the same thing to his heart. (laughs) God damn, that's so ice cold, bro. What? That's so ice cold. Is that what we're doing? Like, what? I have so many questions about that specific magic trick demonstration. Why? Where to, why where do to you, start? <laughs> yeah. Why a coin? Like, why do you need the demonstration part? I guess maybe to show them, like, Look, bro, I'm I've got crazy weird magical powers. But then the specific threat of I can make your heart disappear? I mean, look, man. <laughs> Is it just so over the top to be like completely like I better not fuck with this dude because he's crazy and he has magic? I mean, okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> so I feel like you could have shown you could have like Showed the dude a pistol in your waistband and it would have had basically the same effect. Uh, I see. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think he would. Okay. Because if somebody what? came to my door and threatened me with a gun, I'd be like, cool, cool, cool. I know how those work too. And I can like defend myself. But if someone's like, hey, 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 I can fucking melt your heart from outside your body. Watch <laughs> me do it to this coin. I'd be like, well, <laughs> that's a different thing. Like that's, I'm I don't sorry. have a, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a gun to fight back against that fight. Uh, that's a good point. You are pretty defenseless against a, a bald wizard who can make your heart. Disappear. I'm saying like, if that guy's like, Hey, hey watch me. I, I can make your heart stop from over there. I'd be like, well, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not really in a position to disagree with you, sir. So fair. You're right. Fair I'll enough. do what you say. Um, then quote, his speech slowed down like a record player in slow speed. Okay. And he rose unsteadily to his feet little by little and said, my energy is running low. I must go now. Goodbye. I'd have been like, Hey, is that cause you did your coin magic trick? Cause if you got that worn <laughs> out by playing with a coin, you're never going to be able to make my heart melt. Motherfucker. I'm saying this guy doesn't seem that intimidating. He's got like some, <laughs> some little sleight of hand going on and then he needs to take a nap hey bro here here's a napkin why don't you kiss that lipstick off it real quick and uh let's see let's see what's really behind those curtains um he made it to the door and walked Today down I the got steps time. <laughs> he walked down the steps like a drunk toddler uh and then you know how kids they gotta take like they can't they gotta put two feet on each step oh yeah he did it like that, but drunk. And then disappeared uh, in a flash of light from his driveway. Did he apparate? He apparated the fuck out of <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Did he make a boom? <laughs> boom. He gone. So that's the story that we originally told on the Men in Black episode. Yeah. Turns out he was threatening to make his heart disappear over this UFO case that he was studying. 
that was also documented by the United States Air Force and Norway Maine PD. That is a much bigger and much more interesting version of that story when you have that context involved. Agreed. Uh, there's one more part of the men in black angle, potentially, which is that two weeks after the uh, the wizard guy showed up and made the coin disappear, uh, Dr. Hopkins' son, John, and his wife, Maureen, who lived with him, uh, got a weird visit as well. And a man and a woman dressed in all black knocked on the door. And for some reason, John also let them into the house, which like, Maybe after the guy showed up and told your dad he was going to make his heart disappear, don't let strangers into the house for a couple weeks. Hey, man, sh- show me your hands. <laughs> <laughs> you got any hearts hey, I got a, in your hands? I got a, I got a quarter. Do you feel like doing anything to this quarter? <laughs> no? Okay, you can come in. That's how you... It's like you can't do a pat down, so you got to do a quarter check. <laughs> you just just tempt him with a quarter for a minute and see if he yeah, does anything. Yeah, this, this make you feel any type of violent? <laughs> Do you wish this wasn't here right now, perhaps? <laughs> you, you gonna try to uh, spin this in circles and then uh, make it explode? You have the sudden urge to banish anything to another realm? <laughs> um, so these, these people come into his house and they're like stumbly. And they, they sit down in the living room and the man asks, quote, what do people talk about in an attempt to start a conversation? Mm-mm. Which, bro, fucking been there. The, fir- the first time any of us hang out in public again, that's going to be all of us. Oh, Just be yeah. like, what? Um, what? What do we do? What is conversation? How, do, how does conversation work? Y- yeah. You and I are going to be way better <laughs> off because we've been having one like or multiple solid ones a week because of the show. But I think other people are going to be like, I don't know how to like talk to a person. Especially face to face when there's like more than one person at a time. Oh my god, you got to be that. reading fucking social cues and body language. Oh, it sounds like a nightmare. Let's just never end this. <laughs> uh, so then after asking what do people talk about, the two fucking weirdos start making out and groping each other while while asking John if they're doing it right. Mm. No. <laughs> no. Nope. Also. Honestly, probably me the first time I'm in public again. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you, you're gonna you're gonna make out with your wife in public and then ask people if you're I'm, doing I'm, it right. I'm making out with and groping all my friends as soon as we can hang out. That sounds a watch, little watch out. A, that sounds like a little too excited <laughs> about the quarantine ending. Hey, yeah, beautiful hair. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, the phone then rings and john goes to answer it for some reason leaving his wife alone in the living room with these two fucking freaks making out on his couch that's just disrespectful and at that point freak number one asks marine quote how she was put together and if she had any nude photographs of herself wow this got a little too sexy too quickly (laughs) too sexy too sexy at that point, John comes back to the living room and kicked the two crazies out of his house. Should have been doing that, bro. So that one to me, although like the timing is weird and their behavior is obviously super weird, sounds like he probably just let two drunks into his house. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't feel like there's any like real. They didn't have any magic. They didn't have any magic. They didn't bring up anything, right? No, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't tell him not to, like, study anything. They didn't disappear in a flash of light. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like one of those something weird happened adjacent to me. So now anything weird that happens is evidence of that other thing. Right. So anyway, that's that's the end of uh, this three part story. Damn, son. But yeah, I. I because I always thought that Men in Black story was just like, I only told it because it's one of the goofier, more outlandish Men in Black stories. Right. And I really didn't give it any sort of credence. But in the context of these other sightings, it's kind of weird. It's definitely significantly more impactful when you have the full context of like what was going on in the area at the time, for sure. Right. And the fact like it was three of these things happened 
on the exact same night. Yeah, which is like its own version of wild for sure. It, in a pretty sparsely populated area too. It's not like this was, you know, downtown Chicago and or like the O'Hare airport incident or something where like, yeah, you have thousands of people in one place. Right. Like if something happens, lots of people are going to see it. This was three different groups of people in three different locations and in one of those locations over like every night for a, close to a week. Yeah, that's some like and it's showing up on radar and I don't know. It's not just like a glancing like, yeah, that was a kind of a weird thing. It's like a it's a trend. There is a series of events here. Yeah. Huh. The the UFO itself does read a lot like maybe early drone technology to me, though. I was kind of thinking it had a blimp like thing going on, uh, like 50, 60, 50, 56 feet long, kind of football shaped and not making any sound with like a blinking light on it. I don't know. Yeah, the size is a little weird, um, although that wasn't. Oh, no, that was from the, the Air Force reporting the four car lengths thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's pretty fucking big for a drone. Yeah. That's kind of why I was thinking, because it would be a pretty, like, decent size of, like, a small blimp. I don't know. Right, which would also maybe make sense with the uh, the heat distortion angle. But what would have been causing that? Well, don't blimps involve hot air or am I, are they just, well, or maybe I mean, it's a hot air balloon type of situation. I guess it depends on what, I mean, we're in the seventies cause you can, I mean, you can float blimps with a bunch of different stuff, you know, like you can float them with hot air, but you can how, also float them with like helium or how are they propelled usually though? I thought it was with like straight up propellers, but Okay. I don't know. <laughs> My, uh, I googled blimp propulsion, and the first <laughs> me too. The first and the first returned uh, site is blimp science from GoodyearBlimp dot com. You know, brilliant because yeah. there's probably plenty of people who all the time are just like, "How the fuck does that thing flying over the stadium work?" Movement and steering engines. Three four-cylinder, 200-horsepower engines are located on either side of the envelope and can propel the airship at speeds of up to 73 miles per hour. Damn. That's legit. Yeah, I, I don't know. The, the technology itself doesn't seem that crazy to me. Uh, the only thing that would be weird is, like, the if it really was moving somehow 10 miles in a matter of seconds. Um. But yeah. I don't know how exact and reliable those radar readings are. Right. Especially being reported like fucking fifth hand or whatever this is. Right. And if it had the ability to go 70 miles an hour or say a military version with the ability to go even way faster than that, like, I don't know. Yeah. Just like the, the era and the fact that they were spe seemed specifically interested in nukes. Uh, reads more, more human than anything to me. Yeah, but. that that layer of like morality on top of it is always an interesting, like feel feels very human. Yeah, and then the, I mean, I don't know what to make of David Stevens's story. That shit is bonkers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then like the the I mean the hypnotic regression stuff is always super suspect to me. Agreed. But, it seems clear that he saw something weird, and then it's very weird that someone would show up at his house the next morning asking if he saw a UFO and telling him to shut up about it. Yeah, for sure. Especially before he had told anyone, if that story is accurate. For sure. It also, not to be like too hardcore skeptical, but that's a lot easier of a story to be able to tell after the fact that helps legitimize your participation in the craft, you know? Yeah. I mean, tracing any of this stuff is damn near impossible. Yeah. 
when it's like just all anecdotal for the most part. But for sure, for sure. Anyway, that's what I know. Word, Shout man. out to Michelle for sending us some weird, weird ass fun books. Yeah, and a whole bunch of other shit. Thank you again, Michelle. You're the fucking best, uh, and we very much appreciate you. Um, and we appreciate you, the people listening to this right now. Thank y'all so much for listening all to the show. Michelle's and non Michelle's alike. <laughs> we appreciate y'all being here. Um, if you want to leave us a voicemail, once again, at 612 246 4614, we'll do another voicemail only episode coming up soon. Emails are high at whatifpodcast.com. Uh, you can go to shop.whatifpodcast.com. There's t shirts. You can buy a shout out on the show. There's all kinds of stuff up uh, up in the shop. Uh, we are so close to 500 iTunes reviews. We're like five away now. <laughs> he says for the 15th week in a row. Yeah, for like the fifth week in a row. <laughs> We're almost 500. We'll do a live show when they uh, when we hit 500. So uh, go check those out. And shit, I don't know nothing else. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. I think this is such a dang neat show. 